Karen will put greet. Yeah, Karen's putting some greet greet us all. Um, will put in where they are. I don't even know how far flung we are geographically, besides a few in Seattle and, and the number in California. I don't know where they're doing this. Oh, I heard Pennsylvania. Right. Hi there. Does Zoom work between the U.S. and Iran? Oh, that's, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, mean, I know I, WhatsApp I, does quite well, but I'm yeah. not sure about Zoom. Yeah, I didn't know. No, I've, we're working, we're, there's an author in Palm, Syria, amazing architect who's written a couple books, but Oops. Zoom does not work between here and there. So we're working on other things, so. I think it's a bit of a challenge um, yeah. in Iran as well, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, well, there are, yeah, yeah, I know there are other ways. I'm just curious. <laughs> Yeah, but no, it's definitely good for us to think about um, because it would be wonderful for us to be able to do some cross-border right. events. Yeah, yeah well, like uh, the sister city some... part. The sister city <laughs> part of this uh, discussion could be you do um, programs like that too. Yeah, it's right up our alley. <laughs> oh, Kave says our friend Kave Basidi says no Zoom unless you have special filters. Okay, thank you for the. <laughs> that's the <information. laughs> good. Yeah. Kava is a really fine poet. Mm. I have to shout out to him. Welcome, everybody. Kavi Akbar, the poet's parents live here in Seattle. A different Kave poet. Where in Seattle are you, Daniel? Um, I have actually been living in the Central District for the yeah. past five years or so. Yeah, that's as long as I've been living in the city. So, okay, good. Yeah, loving the neighborhood. And it's, you know, over the past five years, I've really gotten to yeah. know the area better. So it's, uh, it's home now. So, you work for the city? Um, I do. Yeah, I work for Seattle Parks and Recreation. Okay. So, I, we I are looked up, but I wasn't sure what was the most current. <laughs> Yeah, no, we are, um, yeah, we're gearing up for welcoming everybody back because people uh -huh. are getting vaccinated and are, especially with this amazing weather now, they're ready to get out and be in yeah, parks. So a year ago when the parks, it was uh, the irony of the parks were being closed. Ah, uh, yeah, it was a really challenging year for sure. Yeah, people want to be outside, but yeah. the parks would lend themselves to people still clustering too much at that point. Yeah. Um, and I see some are already active in the chat box. Um, for attendees, I, I encourage you to um, right above uh, the chat box, there's a little drop down menu. Um, make sure that you select panelists and attendees so that we can all, uh, both that we can see your comments and the other attendees um, can see them as well. Oh, yeah, I see there. People are saying things to the panelists, but not everybody. Yeah. So, yeah, I want everyone else to be able to, to read them to too. Thanks for hosting. <laughs> Karen will give me, usually gives me a cue and it just kind of the attendance that people coming in level off a little bit. Let me ask you guys at the bookshop, what are you guys reading uh, that's uh, that you're excited about these days? Well, apart the, from the topic of Iran. Uh, one of the books, actually, I was mentioning this architect from Ham Syria is a woman named Marwa Al Sabuni, who has she writes in English, um, which may be a way reason she can write what she writes and not get in trouble there, but um, or at least, but um, she's an architect and she's done a new book called Building for Hope, which is a lot about urban design and gentrification, and but she, her range of of things she knows about from um, you know traveling around a little bit. She can't come to the U.S., but she can travel other cities and what forms of development have taken and, and what that does to class and inclusion in cities. Um, and uh, but then her frame of reference, because she's had con there's been con cultural continuity even for all the invasions and everything else. 
in a place like Syria is she can range back and forth kind of in, in a de deep way uh, historically um, and does so kind of light handedly and it does it nicely. Um, uh, God, there's a lot of good books out right now. Um, there's an, an indigenous writer named Leanne Simpson who's been writing really good fiction and uh, essays. Um, we're, you're in Pennsylvania? I'll try to go yeah. uh, Right now, yeah, I'm in the Philly suburbs. Okay, yeah. I just For the read, time uh, a great book with a lot of Philly in it is um, Yara uh, um, Alegre Shahidi. Udis, uh, who she's the woman who did In the Heights, the musical with Lin -Mel Manuel Miranda. Oh, wow. And her memoir called um, My Broken Language is brilliant. It doesn't have anything about the Broadway shows or her plays, but it's finding a voice. It's being, it's, it's a Philly book through and through um, oh, Puerto cool. Rican cultural group. And um, anyway, it's a fabulous book. Um, oh, cool. Thanks for the heads up. What was it called again? My, My Broken, broken Language. language. It's just awesome. out about two weeks now. Yeah, it's a great book. Who put it out? Do you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you know who put it out? Which yeah, publisher? Uh, one, the One World imprint of okay. Rand House, which is yeah. Ibram Candy and Tanasi Coates, and, yep. and has been doing some amazing other books too. I mean, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So that, but that's a great memoir. It's the best that memoir like that I've read in a long time. I think. Wait, wait for my here to chime in here. Otherwise, we can give book reports all because now I want to hear what everyone else is reading. <laughs> I love talking that's, about this stuff. Well, that's what we do in the bookstore too. I mean, that's so much the life of um, in 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 the bookstore is talking about books. Yeah. Um, Karen does say we should start. So, um, greetings, everyone, um, to everyone who is joining us and listening to a little bit of book talk here um, as we're getting going. Um, on behalf of my colleague Karen, who's doing um, all the good work behind the scenes here uh, and myself for Elliott Bay Book Company, which is here on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle um, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we are welcome everyone who's joining us for this program you're gonna to hear today, um, which is occasioned by the publication of the anthology, <laughs> My Shadow is My Skin, uh, Voices from the Iranian Diaspora. And I'm gonna say very little here because um, uh, I will certainly be turning this over to um, Danielle Lotvi, who's here in Seattle, but I do want to say we are very excited about um, from Nancy Penrose um, Mutker's uh, uh, approach to us about this, uh, probably not that long ago, is the way email and time are now, um, to hosting this to it actually coming about. Um, you know, it's been something we've been excited about, and also to say it's uh, given all the logistics of, of these days. Um, it's been a feat that everyone involved has gotten organized and, and are here today virtually as it is from all the places they are. Um, this book is important. And I know at Elliott Bay, we have over the years been selling many uh, and, and putting in people's hands and having readings of writers of, of Iran. Um, and every year we've also, um, when it's an in-person occasion, uh, been uh, excited to be part of the Iranian festival Usually we're next to the table that has the great people of Mage publishers here from DC, Mohammed and um, Najma uh, Batangli, who do the, she does the great cookbooks. He helps make sure they do literature. I think they have a daughter here in Seattle. So it's also familial for them. Um, but also there at that festival right around the corner from us is the table for the Seattle Isfahan uh, Sister City Advocacy. And it's, it's on their behalf and with their um, orchestration here, I think that um, this has come about, um, and I think um, Danielle, uh, Danielle, and um, maybe someone, one or two others, will say a little more about those efforts because um, the Sister City program was one that um, is instrumental for Seattle in establishing connections with places like Bergen and Kobe and um, and um, uh, oh God, there's all sorts of uh, Tashkent and others, and this, the program got suspended, but um, but there are initiatives to revitalize it and reconnect it, especially to other parts of the world and other communities where um, our connection really matters, even if our, our national governments aren't doing so well in that regard. So um, you will hear from the editors of this anthology, you'll hear from several contributors, but now you're gonna hear um, from Danielle Lautvi, um, who's, with, who's here in Seattle, he's with the Seattle Isfahan uh, Sister City Advocacy, and he will um, take over, run the program, he'll explain who's gonna say things and, and uh, read, and he'll um, also, as I'll say too, put um, 
your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, portal and, and also comments in the chat as many of you are. And on that, I will disappear here and come back at the very end, but please um, give your good attention now to Danielle. Thank you so much, Rick. Good evening, everybody. My name is Daniel Lutfi. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am a board member of the Seattle Isfahan Sister City Advocacy, um, or CISCA for short. Um, we are a community-based organization dedicated to building people-to-people -people relationships between Iran and the US. Um, our work centers around uplifting the voices of Iranians in diaspora. Um, and share our heritage with our neighbors. Um, and that's why we're so excited about uh, today's conversation. Um, I want to thank uh, the Elliott Bay Book Company uh, for their partnership uh, today and to our wonderful authors uh, who've agreed to join us uh, for the virtual book reading. Um, and I wanna give a special shout out to my co-lead uh, from the Cisco side, uh, Nancy Penrose, who, um, who's also a fellow Cisco board member. And I'm just eternally grateful for her help um, in making this uh, event come to reality. Um, Siska, you may know us from our signature event, which is our Noru celebration at Seattle City Hall. Uh, we're sad that we haven't been able to hold the celebration in person in the past couple of years, uh, or last year and this year, due to the pandemic, but uh, we are excited to bring back uh, our programming bigger and better uh, once we are all vaccinated and um, can gather again safely. Um, so today uh, we have a virtual reading program for you. Um, the, just for your uh, information, we will begin the conversation with uh, the editors of uh, My Shadow is My Skin, uh, Catherine Whitney and Layla Emery. Um, and then there will be a portion where each of the five authors who are participating in today's conversation um, will have an opportunity, have a few minutes to do a brief reading uh, from their piece uh, in this anthology. Uh, you may know that there are 32 pieces uh, by 32 different authors in this anthology. So it's a, it's a world, of, world of stories and I really, really encourage you all to, to check it out. So um, if I can ask uh, Layla and Catherine, uh, Layla Emery and Catherine Whitney, the editors of uh, this wonderful anthology uh, to turn their cameras on. I would be really grateful. Um, born to an Iranian mother um, and, and an American father, Leila Embry grew up in Massachusetts and now lives in the South. In, in addition to being co-editor of My Shadow is My Skin, she is also a poet and a medical editor specializing in epidemiology. Leila's writing appears in the Michigan Quarterly Review, parentheses, journal and matter. Uh, her poem, How Do You Say That in Farsi, was nominated for the 2019 Best of the Net Anthology. Leila received a BA in Comparative Literature from Smith College and an MA in Creative Writing from Johns Hopkins University. And Catherine Whitney uh, was drawn into the Iranian diaspora through marriage and first wrote about it in the anthology Because I Said So. 30 mothers write about children, sex, men, aging, faith, race, and themselves. She currently lives in Berkeley, California. Welcome, Leila and Catherine. Thank you so much for having us, Danya. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so glad that you are here. First of all, thank you for, of course, thank you for joining us today. But uh, more importantly, thank you for gifting this this book to us and this world. Um, so I wanted to start the conversation kind of where, where the book began. So I wanted to ask, you know, what inspired this anthology um, and how did it come together? Uh, well, Catherine and I met uh, at a work writing workshop in Berkeley that was taught by uh, Persis Karim and Anita Amirzvani. And the topic of the workshop was um, writing about Iranian identity. Uh, and Catherine and I, um, we live on op opposite coasts. Catherine, you know, as you mentioned, she's in Berkeley. Um, I came from North Carolina to attend the, the workshop and it was an incredible experience, um, truly 
life-changing in so many ways. And uh, through that experience, um, Catherine and I got to know one another. Um, we got to know Persis better and uh, Persis really encouraged us to, uh, you know, move the anthology, um, the idea of, uh, you know, producing a, an anthology towards um, the nonfiction side of things. And so the idea was born and we spent five years in total on it. So this was 2015 that, uh, that we met. And Catherine, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about the um, sort of the impetus for, for the thematic elements. But. Well, what was interesting is that the, the, uh, the workshop, the Persis and Anita really emphasized the broadness of the Iranian diaspora now mm -hmm. and the diversity. And it's no longer, you know, what you think, what, what people had historically thought about in terms of the great migration at the time of 1979. So those, a lot of people have come to, to the US. We focused on the diaspora in the United States. And um, so Iranian, the Iranian diaspora looks very much like a mosaic. And we felt really strongly that we wanted to pull stories that were told, that had not been told before. And the people in the workshop, that's where it, it all sort of started because there were all kinds of people in this workshop and voices and stories that were so exciting. And we really left there thinking these are stories that need, really need to be told. So we left with, Persis really did hand us the torch because she has also done three anthologies herself for work month, many, many, several anthologies. So we like took out, carried on the torch um, and did to, to bring these nonfiction voices into the world. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you mentioned, you know, the concept of the diaspora. And um, I wonder if some maybe in our audience who may not be as familiar with the term or the concept, you know, one question I wanted to ask you was, um, who is in the Iranian diaspora? Um, and, and, you know, who's, who's part of it? Um, because that, for me, that has been a, it's been hard to define and maybe that's a good thing um, to kind of not put it in a box, but I wanted to hear from you um, in your experience working with, um, you know, authors from, from the Iranian diaspora, uh, who shapes who shapes this world? I think one thing we realized throughout um, the creation of the anthology was that the diaspora is vast and ever-changing. Um, and it includes not just people who were born in Iran and came here after the revolution, um, but the, the children of those individuals. It includes um, you know, first generation Iranian, second generation, um, but it also includes um, more broadly those who have um, married into uh, an Iranian family, have Iranian children, um, or extended family, uh, and it's really a beautiful thing. And I and I hope that we have captured that in the book. And and for the purposes of of soliciting essays, we actually cast a very broad net, and we said anyone who has any kind of relationship to mm -hmm. Iran. So we got we got we got a lot of essays that we unfortunately couldn't include, but we found we had got essays from people who had spent time in Iran or who had been in the Peace Corps in Iran or who so there were people so we really defined it as in this case, you know, anyone who has any kind of relationship to the country. Yeah, and I think another thing that we realized throughout um, the process of trying to choose what we would ultimately include in, in the anthology is that there's there's no one thing that defines being Iranian. Um, Iran, being Iranian means something different to everybody. And I think, uh, I think all of the different pieces in the anthology speak to that. There's no one way to be Iranian or Iranian American. And, uh, and that's really a special, a special gift, I think, that, that we've all um, been able to, to share in and learn from one another. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, uh, I think it, for me, you know, the biggest strength of this book is uh, the diversity of voices that it brings together. And it really carries that, uh, the point that you were just making home, which is that there is no one way to be Iranian and um, everybody has their own journeys. And I'm so grateful that uh, through the stories that were told in this book, you were able to deliver that message. And, and I hope everybody um, gets a copy of the book um, and, and has a chance to read it for themselves. Um, and uh, uh, 
we're going to start the Q and A or the excuse me the reading portion with authors soon. But one question I wanted to um, uh, pose to you was um, any advice you might have for uh, the young authors in our audience today. And and by young, I don't mean age wise, um, by just you know those who may be in the earlier stages of their writing uh, journey, who may be thinking about starting writing or who may have already written a bunch, but have never kind of taken that leap to get it published. Um, any advice that you wanna share? One thing um, I would suggest is, and, and this is something I, I struggle with myself, but um, I think it's really important to uh, feel as though you can even write about the hard, ugly things and, and to kind of remove that, that sense of judgment or shame. Like I can't be writing about this or who's going to be reading this or who am I going to hurt or offend if I you know, put this out into the world? Um, because sometimes that's where the, the most special, important um, stories are you know, the things that we hide within ourselves, the things we've never been able to speak about. So um, that would be my small bit of advice. Catherine, what, what do you think? Uh, looks like Kathy may be temporarily frozen. Catherine, can you hear us? Oh no. Oh no. Well, this no. is this is the reality of the world of Zoom. I'm sure um, she will join us soon. But um, thank you so much, Layla, and thank you so much, Catherine, for again uh, for gifting this to the world and for joining us today um, and so sharing much. your thoughts. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so I want us uh, to begin uh, the portion where we hear from the authors themselves. Um, I what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask. Uh, the authors one at a time uh, to come and read their portions. I will introduce them beforehand. Um, if you if you already have a copy of the book at home, maybe you want to uh, kind of follow along uh, with the authors. But uh, first, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, Cyrus Copeland. So if I can have Cyrus join us uh, with his webcam on. There you are. Hi, Cyrus. Um, Cyrus Copeland was an adolescent in Tehran when his father Max was imprisoned and tried as a CIA spy. It was the dawn of the Islamic Revolution and Iran's deeply conflicted relationship with America. Unable to find a lawyer to defend her husband, Max's wife, Shaheen, represented him before the revolutionary tribunals, becoming the first female lawyer in the Islamic Republic. 35 years later, their son Cyrus, embarked on a quest to discover if the charges against his father were true. Had he really been an intelligence operative or a man in the wrong place at the wrong time? Off the Radar was the result of his quest and it won Copeland, uh, Copeland the Chattaqua Prize. Cyrus enjoys traveling extensively and talking about his own experiences and perceptions of Iran. He has written about his experiences for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Slate, and the Huffington Post. He is the author. He is the author of Off the Radar, Farewell, Good Speed, Godspeed, Passwords, and a Wonderful Life. Thank you so much for joining us today, Cyrus. And the floor is yours. You bet. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and again, I would like to thank Layla and Catherine for birthing this beautiful book uh, into the world. Uh, we authors who are in it, and all of us readers who get to read about uh, Iranian culture are grateful to you. So what I'd like to do, with your permission, is read uh, my piece um, called Shadow Nation. And uh, you'll see that one of the lines in the piece actually birthed uh, the title uh, of the book. Um, okay, here we go. For decades now, I've been trying to come to terms with my shadow. That's not some fancy spy terminology or ironic way of throwing shade. I'm being sincere. Carl Jung says the shadow is that part of our personality we reject out of fear or ignorance or shame. I am Iranian American. For the past 40 years, I've taken my shadow, my Iranian heritage, and inverted it. My shadow is my skin. I advertise it. Hey, it's your favorite Iranian. It's often how I answer the phone. 
for example. As a self-appointed goodwill ambassador from a rogue nation, I figure that Young was onto something. He says the way to heal ourselves is by integrating our shadow. To do this, and I'm quoting him, we are obliged to struggle with evil, confront the shadow, to integrate the devil. These days, it doesn't get any more devilish than the great Satan and the axis of evil. Decades after a revolution which voiced that Islamic fundamentalism on an unready world, America castigates and condemns Iran for its apparent fundamentalism, its sexism, its suppression of women and gays, its stubborn refusal to listen to logic or play by the rules, and its grabs for nuclear power not recognizing that these aren't exactly issues that we have put to bed here in America. If we all have a shadow, Iran is America's. It represents everything we fear and have not yet reconciled within our own country. To wit, in 1979, a few days before he was taken hostage in Tehran, Sharjah d'Affaires Bruce Lengen penned a strategy memo on how to negotiate with the new Iranian regime, starting with a few cultural observations. Perhaps the single dominant aspect of the Persian psyche is an overriding egotism, he writes. Its antecedents lie in the long Iranian history of instability and insecurity, which put a premium on self-preservation. The practical effect of it is an almost total Persian preoccupation with self and leaves little room for understanding points of view other than one's own. Overriding egotism, preoccupation with self, these are the exact same accusations the world now hurls at America. In fact, Iran and America are two of the most ethnocentric countries on the face of the earth, perceiving the world through their own unique lens. Later in the telex, Lengen chastises the Iranians for their lack of trust, and you begin to understand why this might be true. Imagine you're Iranian. Look to the left of Iran. There's Afghanistan, occupied by America. To the right, American-occupied Iraq in ruins. Looking to history, a 1953 coup led by the CIA to destabilize Iran's government. Would you trust us? Let's not forget that when Iran actually did try to negotiate with America over the nuclear issue more than a decade ago, they were told by the Bush administration, quote, we don't negotiate with evil. Does anyone outside of superhero movies actually talk like this? These days, both Washington and Hollywood love casting Iran as the bad guy. Well, let me actually take a step out of this narrative these days being the previous four years of the Trump administration. Those days, <laughs> both Washington and, Iran and Hollywood love casting Iran as the bad guy. Movies and TV shows are full of Iranian spies, terrorists, and angry mullahs. We project our shadow onto our enemies, onto screens both big and small. But unlike, say, North Korea, that other axis of evil, whose one note foreign policy never changes, Iran and America are countries that respond to one another. For 40 years, we have fought over nukes, hostages, drones, downed civilian airliners, computer sabotage, espionage, but we have never stopped engaging. And it's like that weird dynamic siblings have. It might be dysfunctional, but it's still a relationship, which means that we get to do what parties to a relationship do argue bitterly, equivocate, judge, defend, and finally make up. Just like we did with Britain, Germany, and Japan. It's no accident that our closest allies were once our bitter enemies. More than two decades after being held hostage for 444 days, Lengen wrote, the United States and Iran must talk, not with mutually negative public rhetoric, but frontally, and frankly, as responsible powers with shared interests in a critically important part of the world. The absence of dialogue has made no sense on any count, strategic, human, historic, political, or cultural, or, Young might add, psychological. If Iran is America's shadow, 
It holds the key to our evolution through the buttons that it pushes in us. So what kind of country do we wanna be? One that extends an olive branch or levels a gun? For me, being Iranian American is like being the child of an international divorce. For 40 years, I've watched my mother and fatherlands demonize and duke it out with one another. But let me tell you what all children of divorce know. We never stop hoping our parents will get back together. Thank you so much, Cyrus, uh, for reading, um, reading that from your piece, Shadow Nation. I appreciate you showing that. Um, we will, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Persis to join us next. And um, uh, Cyrus, you can turn your camera off for now and then I'll ask later on for you to join you us bet. again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder to our audience, uh, we do have a, uh, we do want to hear from you. We want you to be a part of the conversation. Um, so, and you can do that by uh, typing in your comments uh, in the chat box um, and make sure that you select panelists and attendees so that everybody can uh, see your comments. And if you have any questions, uh, either specifically for any of the authors or uh, a question that you want posed uh, to all of the authors when we uh, join together later on, uh, please make sure to use the Q&A feature um, on Zoom. Uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. And you can submit your questions there and I'll be uh, monitoring that so I can bring those up uh, with our authors. All right. Hello, Persis. Um, Persis Karim is a poet, photographer, and a professor of comparative and war of literature at San Francisco State University, where she also holds the Neda Nobari Endowed Chair and directs the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies. She is the editor of three anthologies of Iranian diaspora literature, uh, Tremors, New Fiction by Iranian American Writers, Let Me Tell You Where I've Been, New Writing by Women of Iranian Diaspora, and A World Between, Poems, Short Stories, and Essays by Iranian Americans. She has written numerous articles about culture and literature of the Iranian diaspora for journals such as Iranian Studies, Multi-Ethnic Literature of the United States and Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, thank you so much, Persis, for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's great to be with all of you and especially my fellow authors and fellow editors, Layla and Catherine. I too wanna um, say thank you to Layla and Catherine. I know how much work this was. And I'm really grateful, Danielle and Nancy, that you uh, chose to invite us to read because uh, the book came out last year, right when the lockdowns occurred all over the country and Catherine and Layla missed the chance for a book tour. So it's nice that this book still has legs to walk in the world and now it's running. And so I'm glad to be part of the team. Um, I'm gonna read to you uh, just a section of the essay that I have in this collection called In Praise of, in Praise of Big Noses. And um, I will tell you that my two signature uh, Iranian things are pomegranates and big noses, and I have one. So this is, uh, I'm gonna start kind of uh, towards the first page, end of the first page, and I'll skip around a little bit. Um, and it was actually, the essay was prompted by a poem that I wrote first called In Praise of Big Noses. Um, so if you wanna read the poem, it's at the end. When I was about 11 or 12, I finally mustered up the courage to ask one of my cousins what was going on with the large white bandages across one woman's nose and the black and blue bruises under her eyes. She leaned in and whispered, they've just gotten their noses fixed. It's a nose job. I had seen enough to surmise that it was an Iranian female practice that might one day be visited upon me, but I hoped I would be spared this seemingly regular female rite of passage. Later, when I asked my father about these women's wounded faces, he blurted out, well, my dear, 
in case you hadn't noticed, we've got a few people in this family who have pretty big noses. He smiled and pointed to his own. As a teenager, I'd become aware of the bountifulness of my proboscis and wondered if I would be next. Indeed, I was processing how much more beautiful my sisters were and I wanted to look like them. Without ever asking or speaking about it, I knew that they too had participated in the ritual of nose reduction. Theirs were petite and well-proportioned, a bit Anglo looking, more like Audrey Hepburn's than my budding Barbara Streisand nose. The contagion of nose reduction operations in my extended family seemed more and more prevalent with each passing year. First, it was my older cousin, then, my, then her younger sister, then a sister-in-law, then the daughter of my father's distant cousin. It was the mid 1970s when Iran and the United States were close allies and when there was relative ease of movement between the two countries, plastic surgery had become a big business in Iran. The influx of Western culture, the importation of beauty standards from the US and the influence of American television and movies had transformed the landscape of aesthetics and beauty in that country. And they seemed to bring that aesthetic with them when they em immigrated to the United States. They apparently wanted to be just exotic enough with large brown eyes and voluptuous lips with, with small, perfectly sculpted Anglo noses. Around my 15th birthday during that awkward phase when, when most adolescents' features appear scarily large and unsettled on their still childlike faces and bodies, I realized I was I realized that I was being recruited into this Iranian cult of beauty. The first occasion was at my aunt's house when she told me that I should pluck my eyebrows a certain way, put on makeup, and then followed with the casual comment that I should get my nose fixed so that I could become more beautiful. On another occasion, my half sister gave me a lesson in upper lip de depilation and gently suggested something si similar. You're beautiful, you know, but we Kareems, we have large calves and large noses. You can't do anything about the calves, but the nose you can fix. Several months after that conversation, I became more aware that the odds were against me when I overheard my sister, my full sister, speaking quietly about a behind a closed door with my father about the operation. It was sometime around her 22nd birthday and I knew that she felt increasingly self-conscious about her nose. And though she possessed some of my mother's features, fairer skin, curly hair, green eyes, her nose was decidedly a carbon copy of my father's. In the days after my father, uh, in the days after my sister's surgery, I saw her only once in the white bandages with, a black, with black and blue lines under her bright green eyes. I remember that for the most part, she retreated to her apartment to recover and heal, and we never saw her again until a month had passed. She came to the house and without saying a word, showed off her new nose as if it was a brand new car. Her petite nose seemed to make her happy and she now held her head high. I remembered how it struck me as so odd. I felt both embarrassment and shame for her, but also for me. I wanted to like my nose. I wanted not to feel the pressure to do the same thing she had done. But for her, the operation had been a double success. She was more aesthetically aligned with American beauty norms. And she had, in effect, eradicated her Middle Eastern heritage, a part of herself with which she never seemed to be comfortable. She'd also participated in a rite of passage that she shared with our other two sisters. And despite the age difference between us, her emotional distance from them. It was a way she belonged and I didn't. I was now the only one with my original nose. I managed to avoid the topic of the nose job until around the time I turned 17, when my father, who was acutely aware of the longstanding tradition and the rising costs of the operation, asked me whether I wanted one. He told me that along with the savings he's been, he'd been putting aside for my college education, he'd also saved an additional $3,000 in the event that I wanted to join my sisters in the nose reduction club. Although I appreciated the gesture, 
Deep down, I was distressed by his offer. After thinking about it for several months, I decided to pass on the nose job and instead took the money Baba had put aside and used it for a trip to study abroad in my senior year of high school. I was aware that I was making a choice, an intellectual and now what seems a feminist choice that would set me apart from my sisters and some of my female relatives. I was both proud and a little ambivalent about the choice I had made. I had decided that I would resist the trend and hope that my other attributes would com compensate for my nose's largesse. Years later, I met and married a man who possessed a very large nose. Although he was Jewish and not Iranian, I felt a strange affinity for him. We both laughed at the idea that we came from cultures that sought to diminish the size of our noses the moment we were born. Perhaps I even had a little subconscious appreciation for how my own father had jokingly commented that large noses in men are a sign of both their sexual virility and character, a bit like Cyrano de Bergerac. As I grew older, I came to appreciate how my nose belongs on my face. It works with my eyes, my pronounced chin, and I finally stopped fretting about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Persis, for uh, reading for us from your piece in praise of big noses. I appreciate it. Um, next, uh, I'd like to introduce um, uh, I'd like to introduce the next author, Darius Atafat Peckham. Uh, if I can ask Darius, there you are. Thank you, Darius. And we're going to temporarily say um, goodbye to Persis, and then we will come back as a big group. Thank you again. All right. Darius Atafat Peckham is an Iranian American poet and essayist. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in Indiana Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, Texas Review, Brevity, Crab Orchard Review, and elsewhere. He is the author of the chapbook, How Many Love Poems, forthcoming from Seven Kitchens Press in summer of 2021. His work has appeared in numerous anthologies, including My Shadow Is My Skin, Voices from the Iranian Diaspora. In 2018, he was selected by the Library of, by the Library of Congress as a national student poet and traveled the Midwest in his capacity to teach um, middle school and high school age students about the concurrence of grief and joy in literature. Atafat Peckham was recently a winner of the Breakout Eight Award from Epiphany, a literary journal. He grew up in Huntington, West Virginia and was raised by two English professors, Joel and Rachel Peckham, who also happen to be his favorite writers. He currently studies creative writing at Harvard College. Thank you so much for joining us, Darius, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I also just wanted to say uh, thank you to Siska, Elliot Bay Books, um, and Layla, Catherine, and Persis, always. Uh, for including me in this community um, and, uh, you know, just of people that I greatly respect and admire. Um, and it's a community I've always longed for, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna read the beginning of my essay um, in the book called Learning Farsi. And then I'm gonna follow that with a short poem. Learning Farsi. When I was six years old, my grandparents, Papa and Bibi, took me to a Noruz celebration at a beautifully decorated hall near their home in Saddle River, New Jersey. There, I watched them laugh and speak Farsi rapidly with men and women I'd never met before. Men and women who offered me endless food and hospitality, complimented my good looks and manners, and spoke Farsi in my ear. Bibi whispered translations in my other ear, moving her hands. These men and women looked just like my grandparents, just like me, and in the betweenness of this night, we were all fast friends. For the party's finale, we were funneled out of the hall, many people still clutching each other's hands, echoes of the dance still in their step. I was caught in a torrent of children rushing the small fire we'd soon jump over, a symbol of new beginnings, of renewal. But for a moment, I pulled away, navigating my way through the crowd in search of my papa and Bibi. When I found them, they politely declined my request to jump as many families were doing, holding hands and leaping together. I stood with them for a moment, insistent that they should get in line with me. 
Soon though, I was jumping with the rest of the children, re-entering the line again and again, Papa and Bibi forgotten and receding in the waves of now familiar faces. Dobare, again? How many more beginnings can a small boy have? An old man said to me, chuckling in line just behind me. I shrugged and smiled, searching for Papa and Bibi in the crowd once again. When I found them, I saw them speaking to one another, worriedly, hushed. When Bibi saw me looking, she took a long drag of her cigarette, smiled and motioned with her hands for me to move up in line. I grinned back at her. At the time, I thought little of her thin smile, of her worried eyes, of my grandfather's grave discernment. I was ecstatic. It was a good night. After all, this Noruz was the only time I'd ever watched my grandparents dance together, dance at all. The next day, weary from the night before, we drove to the park where my mother used to play, where she made her first friends. We wrote notes on little pieces of paper and taped them onto helium balloons, letting them go in memory of my mother and brother. Remember, Susie and Cyrus, Bibi used to tell me, remember them always, Dada. I remember Bibi beside me, holding the balloon between her knees, hunched over her note, muttering her thoughts with her pen pressed against her lips. I can't remember whether she wrote her note in Farsi or English, or how many seconds it took for the balloons to be enveloped by the clouds, for the colors to disappear completely out of sight. Next, I'm gonna read a poem from the chapbook that's coming out this summer. Also about my grandparents. I tell them it's their curse for being so interesting. Um, it's called, Here's a Love Poem, Practicing Yoga with My Second Mother. My father, maneuvering his hip bone like roots, the yogi on screen sings, unfurling into the ground. I think of my great grandfather, of my first mother, a young girl watching him from beyond the door as he prays his body in shapes and forms toward God, his mustache brushing the ground. And I wonder whether or not my grandparents are real Muslims, real Iranians, real parents. I could ask, though I've never found them bent to Mecca or to anything, my grandmother telling me she doesn't need some compass to show her which direction faces home, that my mother and brother are in every direction and no direction, that she prays every second of the day and whenever she needs to. She tells me about birds and numbers and my great grandmother dying one spring in Tehran, lifting a frame, touching my picture to her coral lips. I feel warned. There will be many dark and lovely ghosts because I'm not going there. The way the earth warns my bibby of her body failing inside her a little more each day, how close it is to rain, always holding an old cigarette in her body's mouth saying, don't you see, Dada, we all go one way or another. And I guess she is speaking truth in that trail of smoke which shrouds her face, some sort of home. And I guess I should be grateful in my new home, mat unfurled on the back deck of a house I once prayed for with my second mother and the spirited woman commanding us to unfurl with intensity now, my father unfurling his entire being as relaxed as he ever was. The screen sounds like baby. And soon I notice a tiny spider balance on a hair on my arm. I hate the awful bulb of its body and I watch as the roots of its little legs try and make a home there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darius, uh, for reading us your poem um, and a little bit from your piece in the anthology, uh, Learning Farsi. Thanks. Um, so next, I would like to ask uh, Siamak Basuri uh, to join us. Hi, Siamak. Uh, Siamak Basuri is an Iranian-American writer living in Seattle. He has, had, uh, he has had stories published in various journals. His first collection, Better Than War, received a 2014 Flannery O'Connor Award for short fiction. And his second collection, A Sense of the Whole, received the 2019 Orison Fiction Prize. Thank you so much for joining us today, Siamak, and the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you for hosting. Uh, this afternoon uh, as well. Thank you to Elliot Bay, uh, to Rick and Karen for putting this together. And um, I do wanna echo uh, all the folks appreciation for Leila and Catherine as well for all their work putting the anthology together. Um, I'm just gonna be reading a uh, excerpt from uh, a short piece of nonfiction from the anthology, um, which uh, starts from the beginning 
Um, and I think it makes enough of a complete whole to stand alone as an excerpt. So um, this is called The Iranians of Mercer Island. The Iranians of Mercer Island were trying, that much I knew. They were trying in a language that was not their own. It made them look like they weren't even trying. I didn't think I was part of them because I felt like I was always trying. I knew that technically I was part of them. I was Majid and Nahid's son. My father sold houses and my mother cut hair, but I felt like I was trying around them even when they looked like they weren't trying at all. At the end of the night, when they, looked, when they would sing songs from the old country. We would see each other around town and it would be like a discovery. My God, here you are too, an Iranian on Mercer Island. And of course, hello, how are you? But then, what do you make of this place? This last part was unspoken, but present. One way to be was to act like Americans, which was to act like there was, that was no kind of question to ask at all, because that place was bigger than you and your job was to fit into it. But I always thought, all we're doing is asking. That can't be so wrong, can it? It was nice sometimes to think of things that were bigger than you, but you might as well think really big if you were going to do that. The earth, the sky, things that Iranians and Americans had in common. Other times the town would be a perfectly good size to fit into at a high school basketball game or a summer fair. And we would think, who are these people we are fitting in with? They are American. It is a matter of course that we know them better than they know us. What are we going to do with that knowledge? That was what their nightly singing sounded like to me. This singing is all we can do. Okay, but what am I going to do, I thought. The singing was above everything. It was above Mercer Island and the limitations of Mercer Island. It was above the acquiescence we had to make to the limitations of time and space. I was glad that they felt that acquiescence acutely. They felt it acutely when there was something they wanted to say that they couldn't say because they could only say it in Farsi. I couldn't claim that. I almost wished I could. I almost wished I had a language barrier to claim as the reason why I couldn't say what I wanted to say. Then maybe I could feel as free as they looked when they sang at the end of the night. It was wonderful though, when we could build something that created a sense of community for everybody, the adults who remembered Iran and the children who didn't, we would all remember something. You didn't have to remember Iran to know that the people you felt the most comfortable around were the ones around whom you didn't have to think about how to be. There was always a part of me that felt like my successes were American and my failures were Iranian. But all of that fell aside when the Iranians of Mercer Island would gather at the community center. I was more than my successes or failures then. I was a part of something that was big enough to embrace both because we could look in one another's faces and see that there was both joy and sorrow and it was much more beautiful and human to see the world in those terms than in terms of success and failure. They were all too connected anyway. A man could be happy about where he was and sad about where he was not at the same time. Little by little, we began to see that the place we could have here was the place we could make for ourselves. It meant that who you were had to emerge. We owed it to one another. I owed it to the Iranians to try out for the basketball team, even though I got cut every year, because if I did make the team, there would be an Iranian name on the back of one of the high school jerseys then nobody would say that we weren't a part of that place. We had a chance to show them what Iranians were, but this meant that first we had to know ourselves. I didn't know how we were supposed to do that when even the air I breathed was American before it was mine. But I breathed it in deeply until I knew that that wasn't true. It was mine before it was American. It needed a boy to breathe it in before anything else. It needed a boy the same way that the evening sky needed a boy to dream under it, and the stars needed a boy to wonder at them. America needed me, I thought. It didn't always know it, but in its quiet moments, it did. And it needed Iran the Iranians to sing long into the night. It didn't know it needed that at all, but we did. I didn't know how we knew, but I would listen to the singing and tell myself to remember that there was a secret knowledge in the world 
something that wasn't seen in the rush of the day. But the next morning I would wake up and it would seem like the only thing secret was wondering and asking again. I didn't know how to bring that secret part of myself together with the part that knew something for sure. If I had Iran the way they did, I thought, then I would know it. I would know what real longing was. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zamak, uh, for reading uh, for us from your piece titled Iranians of Mercer Island. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to ask Dena Rod uh, to join us um, on the panel. Hi. Um, Dena Rod is a non-binary poet whose work has been highlighted in My Shadow is My Skin, Voices from the Iranian Diaspora, Butterpress, and Imigos, a queer anthology. Their debut poetry collection is forthcoming from Milk and Cake Press uh, in May of 2021. Uh, in 2020, Dena toured with, the, with Sister Split, debuted the chapbook Swallow a Beginning, and joined the Rumpuses Features Team, a fellow of Kearney Street Workshop's Interdisciplinary Writers Lab. Dena writes to illuminate their experiences in the Iranian American diaspora and, and queer communities through creative nonfiction essays and poetry. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dena. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you. I'm really honored to be here one year later after My Shadow Is My Skin was published. Uh, this was actually one of my first acceptances uh, in um, publishing and now my book is coming out next month and that feels like a great full circle moment. So thank you, Leila and Catherine. This essay is called Pushing the Boundaries. I'm bisexual, I told my mom on July 31st, 2009. It was Harry Potter's birthday and I had picked that day to come out to my parents because it felt right to do it on a day that had always given me comfort. I had just come back to town from college and had built up this weekend as the weekend I am going to come out. It was going to be hard, but ultimately fine, I told myself, and I wanted to tell both my parents in person. My dad, however, had other plans and decided to go to a poker game with family friends. My mother plied me with basmati rice topped with saffron and khoresh sabzi, a thick herb-based stew accompanied with sabzi khordan, sweet fragrant herbs. Afterward, she suggested a walk. I waited for my, I wanted to wait for my dad to come so I could tell them both just as I had planned, but I couldn't keep in my secret any longer. After dating women the past year in the wake of an epic breakup for my high school male sweetheart, I found the words bubbling in my throat and couldn't wait any longer and they spilled forth. I finally realized that I've always had these feelings inside. I'm just now starting to believe it's okay. And I don't wanna hide from you anymore. I said, staring straight ahead, but unable to look her in the eye as we walked down a trail near our house. But it's not okay, my mother replied. These four words crushed me. With those four words in the landscape of my mind, my mom seemingly transformed into all those yes on Prop 8 voters, even though she had voted no, I lost it. I took her to task for her homophobia and leaving a wake of devastation behind me, I ran away from the trail and past my house. My friend Courtney, my first kiss turned best friend, picked me up in the parking lot of Navlitz, a plant nursery down the street. I stayed at her house that evening while she practiced for her flute recital and her mom made me lavender mint tea in a chipped opaque mug, so different from the clear glass cups Persian tea is served in. I'd known Courtney and her family since she and I were eight and it felt fitting that this was where I ended up in the arms of soft suburban whiteness. The fear of every worst case scenario being realized coursed through my body. My cell phone will be cut from the family plan. All my soccer trophies, swim ribbons, prom dresses, yearbooks will be tossed in the trash. I wouldn't be able to come back to our house for school breaks and I would be estranged from the rest of my extended family. Indignation then began to intermingle with fear. 
didn't my parents move to the United States so that their children could live a life of freedom? Didn't that freedom include the freedom to love anyone I wanted? For me to become anyone I wanted to be, for me to become the person I couldn't be under the thumb of Islamic fundamentalism. I went back to the house later that night. My dad was waiting for me on the couch in the dark. My mom had called him, told him the news. He'd left the poker game early to deal with this turn of events. I don't care about your being bisexual, he said. He explained that he cared more about how I treated my mother. I apologized profusely and we never spoke about it again until I started dating a girl from Texas named Diana. That a chasm had formed between us. My sexuality felt tolerated rather than embraced. Just another one of the differences between my parents and me. Introducing Diana to my parents felt like coming out all over again. I felt like I couldn't be affectionate with Diana in front of them. Now that I've been with her for nearly a decade, these days I don't hesitate to reach for her hand in front of my parents, but I sometimes think about what the social and political consequences would be if I were to reach for her hand walking down the streets of Tehran. Does Amomedi know? I asked once. Does Arya, does Hostro? Persians like to talk. Even though I didn't speak with my extended family often and knew that they were too polite to say anything to my face, they likely already knew this piece of family gossip and had said something to my parents. They were more proficient in Farsi than I was. And so my communication with my extended family had all but ceased with my discomfort with the language and lack of understanding of what my family was saying around me. Amomedi knows, Hosro knows, Arya knows. My dad rattled off a list of my entire extended family in Northern California <laughs> and a prickly hot cold feeling came over me. The only person I had taken the time to tell directly was my uncle Rasul, who embraced me with open arms and understood completely the reality that my entire family knew about me and Diana without my consent was terrifying, but surely nothing was amiss since my dad said all of this so nonchalantly. It's a different country, a different culture, he said. We have to adapt. This sentiment made me want to protest. I would have been just as queer growing up in Iran, albeit much more closeted. My bisexuality wasn't an American influence. It was a part of me that would have been the same whether I was in Tehran or San Francisco. Yet my father's words sowed seeds of doubt. Adaptation can also feel like assimilation, especially when it comes to growing up in America. At times, it feels like my relationship with Diana is proof of how far I've strayed. Here I am married to a white woman from Texas whose heritage is as middle American as you can possibly get. Would I have had these same feelings I was born and raised in Iran? Would my queerness have spurred me to leave the country as my parents' political beliefs had them? Tracing these threads sometimes seemed as if it could unravel my sense of being Iranian, especially when my dad would reassure me that I was a child of America, not Iran. However, if that were true, the diaspora wouldn't be calling me as it does now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dana, for uh, reading for us uh, from your piece uh, titled Pushing the Boundaries. Um, I wanna thank all of the authors once again and ask you to join uh, the panel. Um, I want to um, I want for us to kind of start a group conversation. So if all the authors can uh, have their videos on, that would be fantastic. Um, so we're gonna begin our Q&A portion. Um, and uh, I wanna again remind uh, attendees, if you have any questions, if any piece spoke to you, you have comments you wanna share, um, or especially a question uh, for either any of the authors or um, any, anyone specific, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, feature um, and share your question there. Uh, so um, the, the first question I wanted to uh, start with, and this is a question for all of the authors, so 
whichever of you would like to start, feel free to jump in. Uh, I wanted to ask, why was it important for you to contribute to this anthology? Um, you know, what do you hope that our community gains from reading the essays that you have shared um, in this in this book? Could I start? Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Not so much about my contribution, but you know, it kind of was the the outgrowth of this workshop and. One of the things that I feel still, even five years after they, um, Catherine and Layla were in the workshop with me and Anita, is that we, many of us, and I would venture to say most of us, carry lots of stories inside us, either the stories of our parents and our grandparents, stories of Iran, stories of immigrating. And I, it's such a wealth of, storytelling and history and um you know that it feels to me like it's an ocean of untapped resources um so for me it's like you know like i never tire of hearing these folks read their work because in some ways it's it's echoing i think a lot of things that many of us have felt but haven't had the language or the the narrative to to the structure to put it into. So I feel like for me, it's it's important both to contribute, but also to kind of recognize that like th there's still so much. Um, it's, a, it's a very new literary kind of sensibility to put these Iranian stories. And as you can see, many of us are half Iranian and that's its own iteration of this, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, following up on what Persis said in terms of like this being like a new literature, I was devouring like Iranian stories and Iranian American memoirs and trying to find myself within those pages and unfortunately wasn't able to. And so that was primarily a big reason why I wrote the piece that I did and submitted it when I saw the call for submissions for Iran musings, now known as My Shadow is My Skin from Cyrus's excellent essay. And I'm really honored, frankly, to see like the impact of the work still a year later and seeing how it's still reaching out to people and they're finding themselves reflected in the pages of what we've written. And so I feel like that's really special for this next wave of Iranian American literature in the US. Others? Uh, want to share, you know, why was it important for you to contribute your piece, your story? I'll say something. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I had no idea uh, when I contributed uh, that uh, the book would be as deep and as soulful with so many uh, artful voices uh, in it. So for me, it was just uh, literally very faithfully kind of casting my own voice and narrative out there and just seeing what happens. Um, as writers, uh, I think uh, we, are, we all kind of are ambassadors uh, uh, of a sort, and our writing is where we do the work of ambassadorship. And the way that we do it is by telling these very personal um, stories of uh, honesty and vulnerability. And that, for me, is my number one job, uh, not only as an Iranian American, um, in which, by the way, uh, you know, America does not have an embassy in Iran. Um, they don't have an embassy here, but you and I, and all of us who kind of speak on behalf of uh, Iran and also in Iran on behalf of America, get to do that, get to be ambassadors through the stories that we tell. And so uh, anytime uh, anybody asks me to kind of contribute to this conversation uh, and to do the heavy, but joyful uh, work of ambassadorship. It's always a pleasure for me to do that. Thank you, Cyrus. Yeah, Catherine, go ahead. I would just say, um, part to, to follow up on what Cyrus just said, um, when I signed up for the uh, workshop, I wasn't sure that my voice really belonged in this, in this, in this group, because, and I said, of course, Anita, am I part of the Iranian diaspora? I mean, do I have an Iranian identity? 
and they really welcomed me with open arms. And my Iranian identity was around you know, giving my kids, my daughter in particular, who was really curious about her Iranian heritage, so facilitating that flow of culture and information. So that that's that sort of was my stumbling block into this whole um, rich, incredibly rich community. So I'm grateful to Persis and Nita for welcoming me in. And that was, you know, that obviously that's how I started, you know, got my literacy <laughs> in this book. Yeah, and, and I'm and I'm really grateful that you're part of this book as well, Catherine. I think um, of course all of the stories are just so valuable, but especially I think um, it's important for others who may be in your position, who may have married into the culture, um, trying to raise, you know, biracial, bicultural kids. I think it's I, I was really touched by the story that um, by the piece that you had contributed to this um, anthology as well. So, um, you know, each of you kind of came to understand and, and grapple with your Iranian identity through very different means. Um, but uh, one thing, uh, you know, there were some common themes uh, that I, as a reader, noticed when I was reading your pieces, you know, things like language or sometimes the language barrier, uh, the, the feeling of kind of sitting on the edge of two worlds. Um, and how, you know, constantly being conscious of how others around us uh, perceive us and our, our people, our heritage. Um, I really want to spend some time exploring this feeling of sitting on the edge of, you know, two worlds um, and, and pose the question of, you know, what is that like? And more specifically, what are some of the challenges and advantages? Because um, I do see some advantages here as well. What are some of the challenges and advantages that come with being in that position, being on the edge of these two worlds. Go ahead. This is something that I have thought about for most of my life. Um, and you know, of course, there's a phrase in Persian, dorage, um, having two bloods or yeah, two veined literally too bad. Um, you know, I think for me and maybe some others of you, I always felt deficient, not quite one or the other. And that um, was always a, you know, a cross to bear. It's like, I'm not really Iranian. I'm not really American. And I had two immigrant parents from two different cultures. So it was kind of complicated by that. But I think in a certain sort of way, it's there are more and more of us in the world, whether we're half Iranian or half, you know, uh, Mozambican or, you know, whatever iteration of cultural mixing. And I think that it's a it's a more natural place to live, if you ask me, because in some ways that there, there is the idea that we hold two eyes two hands, the symmetry of our life is not singular, it's double. And so I see it now as a tremendous asset and a way of encountering and moving in the world that I treasure. And I treasure it because uh, it's a place of curiosity and wonder and also um, vexing, right? And the vexing is the place of creativity and possibility. And so I feel more and more that I'm grateful for that, even the trouble that it caused me as a young child when, you know, my father came here in the late 40s. So I didn't have compatriots from the Iranian context. And I think that's a really rich place. And you, if you see some of the great writing that's happening in the world. It's people who've moved from one context to another, one culture to another, one location to another, and it's a place of enrichment. So um, that sort of being on the, the edge of, is, it's, a, it's a palpitation for me, and I'm grateful for the palpitation. Yeah, I just wanna go along the lines of what Persis was saying. I, I think that there's something really wise in that because um, this idea of like not fitting in, you know, it turns out when you begin to dig into it, whether it's like from a perspective of being biracial or bicultural, um, I think when you begin to dig into it, you start to see that many people and many readers who may not have 
name that for themselves before specifically, they begin to identify with a not fitting in um, in their own in their own ways, um, which may not have to do with race or culture, but with just like the struggle to be a human being, you know. Um, and so that's that's the that's the realm of opportunity, I think, in terms of what um, working on stories and engaging creativity allows. But it definitely, for me personally, it took some work. It, de- it took a lot of work to get there and it continues to be work because, um, you know, what it, it does look so easy sometimes to just bypass that whole thing. Uh, but but if, I, if I do try to do that, like, I, I know, at least I know that success to me is like it, I, when I have some detector within myself that knows I'm trying to bypass that struggle. Um, um, and so that, that feels like a real good reminder to, to stick into it and just feel, find your way through it and know that that's the work, you know. Thanks, yeah, Mac, and thanks, Persis. Yeah, others, what are your thoughts? I want to hear, I think um, both of you have really touched on um, something that I resonate with uh, in my experience, you know, immigrating as a teenager myself, in that um, I think in my experience, it was in the first few years, it felt more like a conflict rather than um, two identities that complemented each other. That that took years uh, of reading about my own people, connecting with, you know, other uh, Iranians in the diaspora and really understanding, um, and I, I, I believe Chris has used this term, an asset, truly what an asset it is to be, um, to know how to navigate between these two worlds. Because for me, it the way it shows up is that it makes it easier for me to navigate other worlds, other worlds and, and spaces that I'm not as familiar with outside of you know being Iranian and being American. There are other spaces that are newer to me and this experience of trying to navigate these two really gave me some tools um, to, to better navigate newer spaces. Um, I, I do have a couple more questions um, and I encourage folks to again, send their questions in through uh, through the chat box. Um, another theme that uh, I mentioned was the concept of, of language um, and, and what the role language plays in, in the way that we connect with our culture. And so uh, Darius, in your piece, uh, you, you touch on this connection between language and culture. And so I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about you know, what, what knowing Persian as a language means to you. How, what, how does that impact your relationship uh, with your heritage? Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm by no means um, a fluent speaker, but I am still in the process as I was uh, when I was uh, 15 and uh, wrote this essay, as per- first wrote this essay. Um, I was at that point learning on my own, which was an interesting experience um, because I was definitely getting a lot of things wrong and I was um, working through things. Um, but But once I started working on Farsi, I kind of took this like deep dive into just my heritage as a whole. And I think it kind of coincided with this love of poetry that uh, that emerged. Um, and so, yeah, it really was like learning this new language was learning this new culture was learning poetry. Um, and all those things now have come to like, I've, I've defined myself with these things. Um, <laughs> it's just really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it, uh, you know, something that Catherine was saying earlier that really de- resonated with me um, was just like the sense of belonging. I, I grew up in the United States my entire life without um, just my grandparents as that bridge to to Iran that I that I went to or uh, to. So all my like a lot of my work about Iran is about them and uh, uh, inevitably. Um, and uh, my my mom died when I was little. Um, who would have been a tether as well. Uh, so for me, you know, discovering these different things, Farsi poetry, you know, um, this community uh, was as close to communing with my mom as I think I could have possibly gotten. Uh, so it became a very like spiritual uh, experience for me. Um, and I think if, if like I am spiritual at all, it's probably uh, connected to my poetry. I, um, if I'm writing a poem that I feel like is 
uh, successful, it's because I felt something closer to her, um, which is um, kind of like, it's good and bad because when a poem's not going as well, uh, it's, 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 it's like really, really um, terrible. <laughs> it's like, oh, this yeah. is, you know, this connection. So I, I think like it's a, it's a consistent like learning and uh, experience um, and it's gonna be a lifelong practice, I think is what I've come to is learning Farsi and all these different things about myself. Yeah, for sure. And do you, do you picture yourself ever maybe publishing a piece um, in Farsi? Oh, oh my gosh, I would love to. Um, I've just started um, translating, it's just like kind of unorthodox, but I've started translating my mother's work from English into Farsi, um, oh. which uh, you don't see quite so often like American journals because nobody can speak Farsi in American journals, but um, I, that is one project that I'm really uh, committed to is, is beginning to write my own work in Farsi, like in the beginning in the language instead of thinking in translation. Um, and then uh, also um, moving my mom's work into that, into that medium and language. Very cool, very cool. Um, so uh, Persis, in, in your piece, you write about fake noses and as a fellow big nose Iranian, <laughs> Um, I, I really found your your piece to be touching and kind of um, lighthearted in in certain moments. And I and it, obviously this issue of you know nose jaws, this concept is such a um, kind of unspoken reality uh, in our in our culture. So I wanted to hear more from you um, and hoping you can speak more to what might this say about us um, about Iranians and 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 the impact that you think. Uh, this concept has on on our community, on, on the way that maybe we perceive ourselves. Um, okay. Uh, well, first a disclaimer. I judge no one for getting one and no one for not getting one. Um, I came to it through my own sort of struggle. And um, I was recently on a podcast uh, Nyack did a podcast in which they interviewed several of us from this anthology and Asal Rad uh, and her colleague whose name I can't remember asked me a question and it suddenly like dawned on me that like there's this you know they're tied up in this whole thing about beauty and aesthetic beauty in the Iranian context is this um, troubling notion that Western beauty and particularly white Western beauty has been imported and embedded in Iranian culture for you know now close to 65, maybe 70 years, but also you know a shift happened also at the moment when Iran sort of became a modern nation state. Um, and uh, Najmiya, but uh, not Najmiya Batmanglij, um, Dana helped me out, you read her uh, collection recently. Um, women with mustaches. Oh, um, Afsane Najmabadi. Najmabadi, that's right, thank you. Um, so she identifies a shift in the sort of aesthetic beauty for men and women um, that sort of begins in the sort of modern, you know, Iranian context. And, you know, it's a weird thing because we don't, attribute colonialism and sort of imperial cultures. We, we attribute it to things like language and education, but very rarely do we um, look at something like plastic surgery um, and aesthetics like that. It's only recently that we've started talking about it, say in places like Korea and Iran and, and also in black American culture, the, the aesthetics of whiteness. Uh, um, and it sort of, you know, it always bugged me that like I saw Iranian women as like this incredibly, they're beautiful, right? I mean, there's this big eyes, big eyebrows, uh, um, all these things that I wanted to sort of embrace and love. And then I saw people like making themselves look more Anglo, more white bread. And, um, and I think it's something that you know, people still struggle with in this context, Iranians, Jews, um, and yet there's a vocabulary for understanding what it means. It's, a, it's an erasure and, um, 
And I think, yeah. you know, I hope there are more people who feel the way I do. I mean, I, you know, if you're in the bit non uh, nose reduction club, call me. I'll, I'll be happy <laughs> to make you feel okay about it. I mean, it's a, it's a thing that I think is, um, it's embedded in questions of uh, acceptance and belonging and assimilation. And, and it's one of many characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's something that, um, you know, I'm sort of glad that I struggled with it. And I'm glad I came out on the other side because there was a lot of pressure. I got a lot of pressure. I think there are more people probably now who, who resist. And um, I follow a few people on Instagram who like, you know, take photographs of people with big noses. And, um, and I, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's worthy of interrogation because it is embedded Absolutely. in some of these um, questions about beauty and whiteness and Western beauty um, that really are a phenomenon of 19th and 20th century contact. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I agree. It's, it's um, definitely worthy of uh, just exploring more for sure. Um, Dana, thank you. I, I'm glad that you're back with us. I think we temporarily <laughs> uh, lost you, but I'm glad you're back. Um, question I had for you. So in your essay, uh, there's a part that you talk about uh, the misconception that queerness, that being part of the LGBTQ community is somehow a Western import into Iranian or other uh, Middle Eastern cultures. Uh, can you speak more to that and why, you know, why is it important for us to understand that queer history is part of Iranian history? Because um, not only are there uh, queer individuals in our history that we can point to, even though their stories are not always told, uh, but that it's part of our present as well. So just wondering your thoughts on that. Thank you so much for asking. I personally found it to be something that took a lot of digging to find um, in terms of finding myself reflected in the pages. Um, I think a lot of the people who came here before me, like came to the US from Iran who were queer, but weren't able to write it down in a way that I am able to right now. Um, Persis um, spoke earlier before this event began about the um, magazine Human um, written by uh, Iranian queers who had um, been in the US. And I also came across in my studies at the James C. Hormel Center at San Francisco um, Public Library two newsletters that were archived. Um, and it was called Hasha, which is Persian for denial. And I was, I learned so much by reading those newsletters and like learned about how specifically like in like the 1979 Islamic revolution, there was a targeted genocide towards um, Iranian homosexuals. And that wasn't something my parents had ever discussed. And it wasn't something that we had ever actually, I had, I had ever heard of in like the, the kind of like the air of the different immigration stories uh, from the folks that I had grown up with and like learning that and reading that and kind of understanding like, oh, this thing that's been deliberately erased as well. And something that has been seen as like, a, I think a dirty secret, like in my essay, I write like, it's like an open, it's an open secret. Whereas like, it's something that everyone knows but no one talks about. And I think that translates to a lot of things in Iranian culture, not necessarily queerness, but our plastic surgeries or our, you know, mental illnesses or, you know, adultery, like things that are seen as like not something that are honorable because I feel like honor is such a huge thing in Iranian culture as well that that forces us to live in these existences where we are denying parts of ourselves to one another. And I really reject that just in my life in general. And I think my writing reflects that as well. And that's actually what a lot of my next book of poetry is about. It's like it opens with um, an Audre Lorde epigraph in that she says, I believe that what is true must be said out loud, even at the risk of it being bruised and misunderstood. And I, I really, really have that as like a driving philosophy for like my writing. And I think that's what 
we need to do to kind of create space for the next generation of Iranian Americans, not just Iranian American people who are in the LGBT community as well. For sure, thank you. And I'm really glad that um, that your story is, is a part of this anthology. And just like you said, it, it helps uh, more of our community members find their stories um, in the pages that they read. So thank you for contributing to this. Um, and you, you mentioned poets. I want to ask you and the other poets um, who are uh, on the panel today. Uh, we got a question from our, one of our audience members asking, "Who is your favorite poet?" It's a loaded. No, it's hard. I'm sure you have it. Yes, I'm sure you have a long list. Can I say so myself? If you, if you have, <laughs> yes, absolutely. You're our favorite poet. <laughs> um, but I, I really uh, would am indebted to Solma Sharif's work and, and her book, Look, and am really um, in, indebted to the work that she's done, frankly, and f feel really strongly about, you know, continuing to read her, um, even in 2021, because I know her book, Look, seems to feel like... I think it has like a particular cultural moment. And I feel like now that like the Muslim ban is repealed, like maybe Iranian Americans aren't on the forefront of these types of conversations, but I feel like her, her text look is still really topical. Right. Thank you. Um, so I know that we are at, uh, we are at 6.30 already. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. I know it's been a a really, really good conversation for me. I'm so appreciative of every single one of you for participating in today, for partnering with us, for being so willing and so flexible. Um, so thank you again. Um, I encourage our audience to check out their work. Uh, before I, um, I ask uh, our, um, our wonderful partner, uh, Rick, uh, from Elliott Bay Book Company, Company to come back, I just wanted to leave everybody with uh, just the thought that uh, uh, there's quite a bit happening uh, around us uh, in this country right now. And um, I think it's important for us to be listening um, and to be learning uh, because allyship and, and storytelling is a two-way street. So just as we expect um, and want and desire others to hear our stories, uh, the, the good parts and the tough parts, um, it's also on us to uh, listen um, and hear other people's stories and, um, and and be a participant in the conversation. So thank you again, um, Rick. Uh, I would love to have you join us again. There you are. Thank you. It's been moving and gratifying. And um, it, this has been wonderful in so many ways in the comments. Um, all of you who've been directly participating and everyone who's been putting words into the chat, um, it's um, and this is uh, this feels like one of these you know conversations obviously to be continued in many ways and forms. Um, Shahzad uh, here from Seattle uh, was in here. I remember it reminded me of a night a few years ago when we had an evening at Elliott Bay, which was um, a bilingual evening in Arabic and English devoted to poems of Mahmoud Darwish and um, she and a few others. Um, a woman who's from Tehran but actually now moved back to Boston named Yasi. Um, Esmeli, who's a uh, Esmeli, who's a architect who has been part of the things. But we've we've got to we've got to do work on doing a Farsi um, English poetry night of some kind. That would be fun to do. But um, even more with this night, it goes back to Nancy sending this email to us about inquiring about. Um, we get a lot of overtures, and and here's one for a book that was a year old. And um, what is that? Well, yeah, but yes, this uh, we need to do this, and we're so grateful we have, and and for all what that you've done, and obviously the work is timely and timeless. So, um, and, and there's more of it to be done. Um, there's a nice intergenerational feel too with Persis having done her anthologies and now sort of seeing um, others take on that role. But um, all, the, all the voices that are here in this book that you've gotten to hear just a few of tonight, um, this book, this is, uh, that was a way to come back to the book itself uh, and read the others um, who are in here. So. Um, um, merci everybody and uh, we will uh, stay safe, get well, and stay well and um, we will um, do things one way and another, both this way and in person, um, inshallah again. Thanks. Thank you everybody. Thank you Danielle and Nancy and Rick and Karen, really appreciate and great to see you all. Take care. Take care. Hope to see you in person. Thank you so much.
Night, everybody. Bye. Bye.